Greetings, um, welcome to another exciting video or willkommen in einem anderen aufregend video. This is a part 35 of my game system design series. In this case I'll be investigating converting a board game into a figure game, its advantages, its disadvantages and why it's so rare up to now and why many, many modern figure gaming rules are moving towards a hybrid between these two ways of gaming. I'll be covering an example of how a board game could be converted, in this case the old SPI Marengo, into a figure game set of rules. I suspect this is possibly one of the easiest examples of attempting this feat. First, uh, we need to define what I mean by board game. I'm specifically talking about a historical board game using a cardboard playing area with a hex grid laid across it and cardboard counters, which represent the historical formations or units. The grid, in this case hex base, is designed to regulate movement and combat. Shown here is the SPI quad game Marengo, the playing area rules and counters in the bottom right. Let's define what a figure game is. As its name implies, this uses metal or plastic figures based on cardboard or MDF bases instead of cardboard counters, and the playing area resembles the terrain it's supposed to represent. There is normally a no grids, and the terrain, with some minor concession, is supposed to look like kind of a diorama of the actual battlefield as much as possible. There are hybrid figure game sets of rules, in this case a big base set of rules, which simply uses a large counters with a board game-like values printed on them, but with figures placed onto them to make them look pretty. The playing area, while still attempting to be as a diorama-like as possible, has a much more regulated and board game feel to it. But in this case, we still do not have any grids to regulate movement, which is really a big positive. Going from the other end, some board games also attempt to obtain the feel of figure gaming. In this case, the grids are large squares, which are visible but do not really clutter the playing area too much. The counters, like big battle sets of rules, have a board game-like values on them but attempt to look as much as possible like the troops they're representing. This is a board game but does have a very much a figure game feel to it. The advantages of board gaming is normally it's easy to set up and quick to play. If we look at the SPI quad games, specifically the Napoleonic Battles games, the playing area is small, the number of counters are typically no more than 100 in total, and the number of game turns range from 12 to 20. Players can set up a game in 10 minutes, complete a game within 2-3 to three hours, and pick, pick pack up in 10 minutes, all on the dining room table. The disadvantages are its abstract nature. As you can see here, the counters do not, do not look like the troops they represent, and the playing area does not look like the terrain the battle was fought over. Modern board gaming does a better job at giving players more of the feel, but it's still basically an abstract experience, with the main focus in understanding what's happening historically and to have a nice short competitive game with a clear winner and loser. The advantages of figure gaming is, if you expend the effort, you get the feel of what it was like being on the battlefield. Figure gaming is, for the most part, all about the feel. Beautiful figures, beautiful playing area, and with the actual game coming normally second. For some people, the game itself is almost irrelevant, with few games ever ending. For other players, a good game is still important, but the primary driver is getting the bling right. The disadvantage is it takes a long time to set up and pack up, and unless some real thought has gone into the actual scenario, the game can take too long to complete. While setting up nice figures and a playing area a few times without getting a good game can be done a few times without any issue, eventually most players simply get bored with the process. You do, in the end, need a game if you want this to be sustainable. One solution to the never-ending figure game is to reduce the number of figures and play, let's say, a skirmish game. This works well with 25mm or larger figures and can involve a very large playing area with large terrain and diorama features on it, with possibly no more than 25 to 50 figures per side, if not less, using, more importantly, a very simple set of rules. This is a viable option to get a nice feel and a nice game. The other solution is to use a big base set of rules, where each counter may represent a lot of figures, but is still basically a single counter or unit, of which each player may possess 12 or so counters only. Another solution is to use a traditional figure gaming set of rules, where only the figures are on the playing area, 
but restricted to a small force mix. DBN is a classic example of this, and a standard game requires 12 elements per side on a 2 foot square playing area. Another solution is to use figures instead of cardboard counters in a traditional board game. In this case, figures are being used for a game of Lost Battles. Using the Lost Battles board game for a figure game is probably the only really successful example of this I'm aware of currently, mainly because of the issue of the grid. Lost Battles uses a very simple 20 square grid, which is large enough to not look particularly bad. However, most board games use a hex grid, and there are normally lots of lines as a result. This example attempts to minimise the biggest issue with grid, the lines. This looks nice, but for a pure figure gamer who wants the playing area to look as real as possible, the hexes nonetheless detracts from the experience. There are other issues with hexes. The GHQ hex system, which can give you some rather nice terrain, is really designed for small playing areas. It can take hours to set up a 4 by 3 foot playing area, much less something larger. However, saying that, if you want to go down the hex strategy, as you can see, this is a viable strategy. Gamers can end their search here. All they need to do is find a board game they like, build up the necessary hex-based playing area, and use existing figures, and go for it. However, I have tried this in the past, and have generally considered it not satisfactory for myself. I want no grids on the playing area. Another reasonable solution is to use large hexes, or use a large square grid with the centre of the square marked on the playing area with a mark, so you don't see any lines, but you do see the marks. All these suggestions are viable, but my holy grail is to avoid the use of any form of grids or marks in the playing area. One foot squares may be acceptable, but even then I prefer large continuous playing area services. In conclusion, any board game you select will re require a player to convert the regulated hex based movement system into a non hex based grid movement system. The other thing you need to consider is the complexity of the board games you'll be converting. A set of rules, such as Nay vs Wellington shown here, could be considered an ideal board game to convert. Each strength point represents 100 men and the accuracy in detail is very impressive. The only issue is there; these are not simple rules. Being one of the monster game systems which SPO came out in the late 1970s, as a result only small battles could be simulated easily, such as this one. The other issue is this game system is rather complex and intensive for a player, requiring a lot of minor player actions such as skirmish fire, all very historical and accurate, but a lot of the benefits of using a board game are being eroded with the use of a complex board game game system. My earliest attempt at converting a board game into a figure game was using this game, Nay vs Wellington, and while I retained the use of a hex grid on my playing area because of the effort involved in making the major changes to the rules which uh, would be required to get rid of the hexes, and as a result I was not particularly interested in doing it. In the end, there was no benefit compared with the figure gaming set of rules. I ended up with a larger complex game which took a long time to set up, play and pack up. In the end, I abandoned the project and went back to a traditional figure gaming set of rules. Interestingly, I found this image on the internet, which I think is someone's attempt to do the same thing that I did earlier, but this is clearly not using hex grid. While it's possible this is from another set of rules, the use of the strength point markers make me think this is Nay vs Wellington, uh, or at least uh, some version of the Nay vs Wellington board game using figures. Someone clearly succeeded where I failed, but the other issue is the use of counters and markers. I would prefer to use the figures or elements as strength point markers, thus avoiding the use of any counters on the playing area. I'm also assuming that the, here the scale has been dramatically changed in order to make the game more manageable which is a good option as well, but not one I'll particularly go down with the Nay vs Wellington game system. I still think it's just simply too complicated. After much thought, I've decided that in order to have a chance of success, you need to select a very simple game system, which in my case, I have decided to select the SPI board game, Marengo. I must have played this game at least 24 times, as it was a popular choice in the board gaming competitions I gamed in, and I have rather pleasant memories of the games, mainly because I won a lot. There were some historical issues with the game system, such as both sides needing to have a front line from map edge to map edge, but this could be quickly resolved with some simple command control rules and changes to the way zones of control worked. In terms of counters, each side has 28 to 25 counters each, with each strength point representing about 500 men in this case. 
You would need to add a CNC element and some core commanders to give you your command control, but these elements would not add any real complexity to play. Players would have a choice how they wish to deal with the counters, either a single element or multi-element per counter, with its value being indicated by the, on the counter, or a big base with elements on it, each element representing a strength point. We'll discuss that in a moment. My preference is to avoid any counters on the playing area, so I would go with the latter system where the elements represent strength points, but the former does give you a smaller playing area in theory. Option one is to assume all units are two elements wide with one element each representing a strength point as you can see here. I've selected the largest units of Marengo and shown how they may look when depicted as elements or units. In my suggested game I allow for strength point losses which is not in the original rules. I've done this for a game system reason. The original game depending on surrounding counters with zones of control and forcing them to retreat in order to eliminate them. I need to change this to avoid the front line across the playing area effect of this type of game system. In my suggested system, each strength loss would result in one element being removed. If there was only one element, it would adopt a one element wide formation. Option two uses the same system, except each two strength points is a single element and all elements are only one element wide. This reduces the playing area size dramatically and is probably the optimum system to use. Fractions are rounded or added together to form full elements, which basically the players can choose as they so desire. The last option is to use counters to represent the strength of the unit, as seen here. This is an option, but one which I've decided not to go down. However, other players may prefer this, and there is no reason why the modification uh, that I will be suggesting in this video would not work with this particular system. The scale and movement rate would be determined by the width of the unit. If using a two element width, then each hex would have to be have a width of eight centimeters if using four centimeter wide elements. If using a one element wide unit, this would be four centimeters. In this case, the playing area is 24 hexes wide, which means the playing area would need to be 192 centimeters wide if using eight centimeter wide elements and 96 centimeters wide if using four centimeter wide elements. In terms of depth, the playing area is 39 hexes deep, which gives you an area of 312 centimeters for the large units or 156 centimeters for the smaller units. You do not need the entire playing area, but converting into imperial feet and rounding down, this is either a playing area of 6 by 10 feet or 3 by 5 feet. The first is simply too large and is not practical. If players wish to duplicate the, um, the entire playing area, they need to adopt the single element wide unit. However, if only playing the first half of the battle, as shown here, you could use the two element wide unit if you so desire. While I like bigger playing areas, I have to err on the smaller side and one element wide units is what I will be adopting in my uh, test games. Quick note about scale, in the larger Battle of Nations game, the game scale is much greater and even at this scale the whole playing area is used. Thus while Marengo can be played with two element wide units on half the playing area, most of the other battles in the series cannot. This also shows the advantage of using a board game. The scale is automatically changed to fit whatever playing area you possess, allowing you to fight monster battles like Leipzig on the same playing area as Marengo. My final playing area size is normally 3 by 6 feet, simply because the playing areas I possess is this size. This shows the Austrian force mix rounded down to strength point, two strength points per element. It rounds down very nicely, although I had to reduce the number of units by one. Players could choose to reduce the, num the size of one of the cavalry units by one to give you the correct number of Austrian units. You'll notice the one infantry unit that, that there is one infantry unit with a movement of five rather than three. In this case, I will use light figure, figure infantry figures. The cavalry has two movement rates, 5 and 7. The cavalry units with a movement rate of 5 is represented by heavy and medium cavalry and the faster cavalry by light cavalry. We now have a force mix which does not need any markers, counters or record keeping, at least so far. You can pretty much look at the figure and know exactly what its movement rate is. Here we have the French. The faster French, um, I use a French light infantry figure, and the standard French, I use line infantry figures. For the cavalry, I use light cavalry for the faster cavalry, and heavy or medium cavalry for the slower cavalry. Finally, the faster artillery is horse artillery, and the slower is foot artillery. Players can use whatever troop types they wish, as long as the movement rate is correctly different or identifiable. The way I divide up the troop types is my preference here. Other players may divide them up in any way they wish or in a different way. The important point to note is the figure type determines the movement allowance of the element. 
really nothing more than that, although the artillery element does have some special characteristics in these rules. This is a conversion of half of the map into a typical playing area, the width is 3 feet. This would require reasonably flexible terrain pieces. The built up areas are easy, all my built up areas are based on a 3cm or 4cm square area which I can put together as required. The rivers may require some custom effort or perhaps they could be simplified even beyond what you see here. The brown is rough or broken terrain and I would scatter some gentle hills around as required. If we look at the initial deployment of the Marengo board game, this is how it would show up in this playing area. The French have 8 more units off the top of the screen and 12 more units arrive as reinforcements between game turn 2 and game turn 9. The sequence of play is about as simple as you can get. The Austrian is the first player and the length of the game is 14 game turns, which I imagine is about 1 hour each. Movement rates are determined by the element width. If using 4cm wide elements, or units I should really say, then the movement rates per game turn is shown here. Elements can freely move through friendly units, but may not do so through enemy units and must stop when they enter an enemy's unit zone of control, or movement zone of control. No element can end its move on top of a friendly ele element. The rules are very basic. Because we do not have any hexes to regulate movement, we do need to add some simple movement rules, rules such as MP cost in element widths to turn to the flag, turn to the rear and so on. I've listed some of the rules which should be considered along with, with the existing movement cost converted into something which can be used without the use of hexes. The original used a locked zones of control, which in principle makes life simple but makes it hard to pull back as the French historically did, as well as being difficult to simulate when you don't have hexes. We have, or I have, implemented locked zones of control, and, and I will allow withdrawal as part of combat, but locked zones of control stops all movement except to close into combat, which is mandatory. Marengo does not have any roads and instead has trails, which simply negates existing terrain costs when you move along the trail. The same applies with bridges. Crossing a stream, which should be no more than 2 cm wide, costs 2 MPs, which means reduce the unit's movement allowance by 2 MPs and simply move across the stream with the remaining movement points. If an element remains on a stream, this can be ignored. Only count the first element for crossing streams. As for difficult terrain, players may choose whatever system they wish. My preference is a pro rata system, with each 1 cm crossed costing 2 cm of movement allowance. There are some sleep, steep slopes in the rules. Cross those as crossing them should be treated the same way as streams, except the cost is one MP to cross, or go up it actually. I'm not trying to actually create a full set of rules in this video. As players can do this themselves and use some common sense to fill in any gaps that they identify. The zones of control are the real area that we need to put some modifications. This is dependent on player preference, but I prefer having a movement zone of control, which is a half an element width from any point of an element. Once you move into an enemy zone of control, your movement immediately stops, with some minor facing adjustments allowed in order to line up elements, but nothing greater than 22 degrees. For combat purposes, a zone of control will be one full element distance, which we'll discover why this is the case during the combat section. A game designer would now create a whole list of rules describing what can be done or not. I will not do that here, and once again players may need to use house rules or common sense to deal with this. I may consider doing a proper set of rules for this type of game system, but if I do, that is definitely in the future. Now we come to combat. This is a bit tricky. How could you reproduce the hex-based combat system with something that works without hexes? The first critical rule is combat is compulsory, which means all enemy elements within a zone of control, that is a combat zone of control, which in this case is 4 centimeters, must be attacked. Units cannot split their attack, and if more than one target, and if there is more than one target, they attack all the targets as if it's a single unit. In summary, all elements must attack and all enemy elements within a combat zone control must be attacked. Let's look at this example. In this case, the Austrians have moved within the zone, movement zone control of the French defensive line. The left Austrian units must ensure both units in its combat zone control is attacked. The Austrian will attack the French unit on the right with the center two units, so only the unit on the left needs to be attacked. It has two strength points against two strength points, so the attack is a one-to-one. -one. We will discuss the actual CRT later. 
Swinging way over onto the right, the right Austrian unit must ensure both units in its combat zone control is attacked. The, Aus the Austrian will attack both French units in this case because the Austrians obviously want to concentrate everything on the French unit, which is second to the left. The Austrian on the right has two strength points against four strength points, so the attack is a one to two. Now we come to the main attack, the attack in the center. The two Austrian units in the center attack the single French unit. It has six strength points against two strength points, so attacks at an odds of three to one. All elements are attacking, and all ele enemy elements are being attacked within combat zones of control. There is one modification to the original rules I would implement, which is a kind of stacking. In the original rules, the seven SP units were very effective, and the smaller SP units could never combine their strengths together because there was no stacking. This is, I think, a game floor, and to resolve it, a simple stacking rule can be added, which is three elements can attack out of any element frontage, with other units in the rear contributing to the attack or defense. In this example, the French two-element unit unit has a one element unit to its rear. Players may decide if this should be in base to base contact or within one centimetres. I would prefer base to base contact for simplicity. If the total number of elements is greater than three, only three are counted, but all elements in both units are affected by any combat result. Mixed unit types are permitted, as you can see in the bottom right corner. Any artillery can attack any enemy element within two element widths away or eight centimetres. The artillery must not be in a zone of control, that is an enemy combat zone of control, and can fire over friendly elements. A bombardment attack can only be made if the enemy is also being attacked normally. I mean, in the original rules you can bombard without that occurring, uh, but that does not satisfy the requirements of attacking every element um, in a friendly combat zone of control. Uh, you can use the original rules or the one I've just mentioned here. The uh, original combat results table is on the right. The only aspect I would add is some casualties, um, as well as when the elements retreat. In this system, we do not normally eliminate elements by surrounding them, so some other method is required to inflict casualties. A DR could be a D1, or possibly even a D2, with a numer numeric representing elements eliminated, and some attacking losses could also be expected. On the other hand, players could just leave as it is. On the left is my suggested CRT, with a D1 meaning that the defender retreats and loses one element, and an A1 meaning the attacker retreats and loses one element. Let's go to our original example and conduct our attack. On the left we have a 1 to 1, the Austrian spin a 3, and the French must withdraw one element with back, directly away from the attacker or attackers. There are no casualties. The attacker can advance after combat, occupying the original position of the defender and moving no further than one element's width. Only one unit may do so. In this case, there is only one, so there's no confusion. The Austrians will now conduct the attack on the right. This is a 1-2 to two attack, and the Austrians again spin a 3, which means the attacker must retreat back one element's width back. The French player can advance after combat with one unit, but chooses not to for obvious reasons. Now for the final combat. The the Austrians attack uh, at 3 to 1 and spin a 2. The defenders retreat and also suffers one element loss. The Austrians advance after combat with only one unit. This is the final result of the Austrian combat phase. The only thing I don't like about this is the difficulty of withdrawing from combat, which is what the French historically did. I'm uncertain how this could be simulated, and one of the issues of the Marengo game was how the French counterattack did occur in a historical manner. This also applies to the original board game, so it's no particular issue here. We'll just flow with the original board game system, and maybe someone can think of a good way of simulating history in a more accurate manner. Incidentally, Marengo is a very unusual battle. For all of sense and purposes in this game, there is no flank or rear modifiers. This is reflected by the inability to retreat through an enemy movement zone of control. In this case, if the French were to force were forced to retreat, they would be eliminated as they cannot retreat through an enemy movement zone of control and retreat directly away from any of its attackers, actually, because that basically means it moves into another attacker. Obviously, um, in the final rules, there would be probably a bunch of additional rules clarifying this in more detail. If you're attacking from the flank and front then and forced to retreat, you must retreat away from all the attackers with some leeway if other ele friendly elements or units are in the way, or if uh, friendly elements behind must also retreat to clear the spot for the retreating element. That is basically your sort of cascade your units. 
This is not as brutal as the original game, which I feel is a good thing, as there was too much focus on moving to cut off the enemy rather than the actual combat itself. One of the issues of the original game was the focus on unhistorical outflanking manoeuvres, which did not occur historically. Outflanking was only an issue of if there was sufficiently large force able to do so, as, and this did occur on the French right flank at one stage, but a single cavalry unit was not going to make that much of a difference. Thus, outflanking should only be possible with a reasonably large force mix and with a high-level commander accompanying it. To encourage this, we could have commanders, with at least one being a CNC, and some additional uh, flank commanders. The French were better serviced here, so should have probably three sub-commanders, and the Austrians two sub-commanders. Commanding radius could be 16 centimetres for the CNC and 12 centimetres for the sub-commander. Command control is traced from any point of the general to any point of the unit. When out of command control, movement is halved and no element can move within or into an enemy movement zone of control, thus they can't initiate combat. Sub-commanders are also affected by this condition, but their subordinate units are not if within the sub-commander's command control range. Commanders have a movement of 6 MP and a combat strength of 0. If attacked, they automatically suffer a DE. This shows a possible a game turn one end point. The Austrians are desperately trying to get into attack position while the French are forming their defence, which would be behind the stream, which is actually where it was historically. I think maybe they started in front of the stream and then pulled back behind it. This is an interesting project and one which I will investigate in more detail. For those interested, the SBI games can be downloaded from the internet and the link will be included in the description as well as the last slide of this video. And so we come to a sad ending of my part 35, my video series on game and design theory, in this case using a board game to create a figure gaming experience and what we may need to do in order to make it work. Denken Sie daran, immer für Hill, Hammertlin zu kampfen.